God, we're, we're accelerating towards the end. Make sure you've got Revelation chapter 20 open in front of you. And the, and the bottom line is you need to understand that the centre of this whole chapter is the fact that God wants to bring life. Now, life isn't an empty phrase in the Bible. It is life. It is the banishment of everything that diminishes or reduces our experience of our humanity. God is about us recovering from every element that breaks, damages, gets in the way of us knowing him fully and living wholly. Does that make sense? And so this chapter, very vividly, is about the final driving out and the pushing out of all that is evil and wicked. If you like, it's a bit of a turn back to the beginning. So in the beginning, the first two chapters of the Bible, God created, and what, how did he describe it? Help me up here, I'm on my own. Come on, help me. It was good, or well, very good. Last two chapters in the Bible, we see back there, but on steroids, even better third chapter of the Bible, we see that Satan enters and through his deceit, accusations and lies, everything gets twisted, corrupted and broken. So there is good re- remaining, but it is always tainted and darkened and leaves a nasty taste in the mouth. Third from last chapter of the Bible, we see the unravelling of Satan and the final kicking into touch of all that he has done to bring brokenness. And room. Do we see? So there's this beautiful symmetry. So today, that's where we are. Chapter 20, and this, uh, I mean, Revelation is a, co- a contentious book anywhere, but of all the chapters in the book of Revelation, this is the one on which most ink has been spilt over this whole issue of millenniums and thousands of years. So I'm just going to get it straight out there. This is the only place in the whole of the Bible where a thousand year reign is mentioned. It is mentioned six times in seven verses. It is in the mid, uh, towards the end of a book that deals with symbolism and, whole, and people have built whole systems of theology around this idea of the millennium. Is there going to be a future point where Christ um, sets up a thousand year reign? A bit like the uh, German st- uh, Hitler's thousand year Reich, but a good one uh, you know, on our team. Uh, is it going to be before or after Jesus comes back? What's going to happen? Can I tell you, if you get bogged down in that, you'll miss the joy of what's going on in this chapter. I'm just simply going to unpack what is there. Uh, If you're really particular as to whether I'm post-mill, pre-mill, A-mill or pan-mill, which is, it'll all pan out in the end, uh, I can talk to you about it later, but I'm not going to waste my time unpacking different points of view. We want to get into the text and find out what is there to sustain and keep us. I will just say this. I take this thousand-year period to be symbolic, like all the other numbers in the book of Revelation, a symbolic picture of a long time between Christ's first coming and his return. That's how I take it. That's how I've been taking it all the way through the book. It's known as amillennialism or um, uh, realised millennialism, depending on who you listen to. So when is that thousand years? We're in it, as best I understand. However, I know better than to be dogmatic over words like millennium that I struggle to spell. So there are plenty of people on our team who take that thousand years as slightly different and they've got good reason to and I love them and honour them and it will not be something that we squabble about, okay? The the sad fact of the matter is the certain place, particularly in the the great state of states of America, where people are more worried about what your standpoint is on the millennium. Uh, than they are about whether or not you love Jesus and his cross is where it's all at. So I'm just saying, this is a very small thing in a very small place. Don't get tied up on that one. Team Jesus is what matters. Let's get into the Bible. Right, okay. So, uh, why is the downfall of Satan so important? Well, if you lived in the first century, it would be blindingly obvious because thousands of Christians were getting killed annually. And behind that, it was not difficult for anybody who just had a little snip of what is right and wrong to sense there was was a a malevolent force behind that. Sometimes we pick up on our news, don't we, and we see, I mean, there was that terrible account on the news last night 
of a teenage girl in South Africa, and this will have been repeated countless times all over the world yesterday, but it was the one that the TV picked up on was in South Africa, a teenage girl um, who had been gang, gang raped, tortured, and murdered in a township in South Africa. And the whole community were out going, this is wrong. And there were people there trying to make sense of it, and they couldn't. Why? Because we know that there is something evil and deceitful behind everything. We look at some of the things we see in our newspapers and say, what would drive somebody to go into a cinema with an automatic weapon and blast off all the bullets? What would, what would drive somebody to, to, to instigate a final solution to kill six million Jews plus countless other people besides? We know that there is an evil force behind the world. Uh, at, at work, sort of pulling strings like a puppet master. Now, Satan wears different masks in different centuries. And in our culture, I think he goes down underground and he tries a different strategy. He drowns us in our materialism. So all around us, there are people now who are just getting loaded down and distracted from things that are tr right and true by the accumulation of wealth and gear. He distracts us from the one who really does satisfy with toys, telly, and good times, and with hook, line, and sinker. He deceives us into believing lies about who we are, where we came from, what life is about, and the ultimate one, God will not hold you accountable. So there are very few people who aren't found in churches on a Sunday who, when you speak, speak to them and say, do you think God will hold us to account? They'll go... So Satan is alive and well to a degree, as we're about to find. And his demise, there can be no more urgent thing. And for the people in the first century, as they were getting persecuted, um, and countless hundreds, even thousands, were being martyred, the question is, will Satan succeed? Is God bigger than Satan? Is there any hope? Where is God when it seems like Satan is winning? And so as we've moved through the book of Revelation, particularly this back end of the book, we've seen from chapter 12, we've been introduced to certain characters. There's, there's, the, there's God's church, there's Satan, who is the dragon who's fighting. He uses the beast and the false prophet, the second beast, which is um, uh, political powers and authorities uh, to, to, to do his bidding. There is the prostitute, the city, this whole society built up with the view of trying to get God as far away as possible. So those characters all came in and we saw gradually, one by one, they get walloped out of the way. One by one, they almost come to a last battle. Bang, bang, bang. Good night, good night, good night. Finally, Satan. It's going to be his good night. No, I think he's having a good night, I think. Bye-bye. Gone for good. So as we work through this, I want us to see four things just following through the text as to what's happening. So chapter 20, just like so often has happened, is another rerun of the period of time between Jesus' first coming and his second coming again. Remember, it's like, reading the book of Revelation is like watching the highlights of the Olympics. Usain Bolt running on the 100 metres, the first time you watch it, it's a big panoramic view, you see the whole thing. Then the next day, they go back and they get the talking heads talking, and they do a rerun, and it's just looking down the track, seeing Usain Bolt run at you, and they're, you know, they're commenting on, on his form and his pattern. Is like that. Then there's, then there's the, 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 the one that goes along the side, and it's just seeing how he's ahead of everybody else. And then there's, then there's the bit at the end of, uh, let's rerun him crossing the tape and him winning, and it's like sort of he's doing his thing and all that type. And you see all the different angles. It's the same thing, but they focus in on a different element. We've seen this battle at least three times. Chapter 16, uh, sorry, chapter... 9, chapter 16, chapter 19. We've seen it three times, but the focus, the camera angle, is back on what's going to happen to Satan the dragon. Okay? Long introduction, I apologise. Let's dig into the text. Where are we? Okay? Verses 1 to 3, your enemy is bound. And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss, and holding in his hand a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations any more. That's important. Deceiving the nations any more until the thousand years were ended. 
After that, he must be set free for a short time. Notice that Satan, said it before, is not your mate. He's an accuser and a deceiver, and he kills by using lies. But he is not God. Here we're told that it's as easy for the Lord which, uh, to use another angel to get a whopping great chain and bound him and do it forcefully, so he is caged. Now what is pictured here as being done by a great angel, we know from the gospel, because Jesus tells us so, that it was Jesus who bound and held and tied up Satan at the cross. So we had read, didn't we, a little while ago, Mark chapter 3, where Jesus himself uses these words. Uh, remember, the, the, the leaders of the nation have come and said, Jesus, you're doing the devil's work. And he said, that don't make sense, because I'm flattening the devil. You know, a house divided against itself cannot stand. No, 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 the news here is actually, I've come to bind Satan and his work. Verse 25 of chapter 3 of Mark. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house, that's Satan the strong man, and carry off his possessions, i.e. rob him of the people that he's got, unless he first ties up the strong man. That word ties up is the same Greek word as bound in Revelation chapter 20. Christ has come to bind the work of Satan, grab people from the dominion of Satan's lies, and bring them into the kingdom of grace. Luke chapter 10, verse 18, Jesus said, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. John chapter 12, verse 31, Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world, Satan, is driven out. And that's why there's such strong and oppressive. He has seized this dragon, this ancient serpent, serpent, who is the devil or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss, the place from which spiritual forces, uh, evil spiritual forces emanate. We looked at that way back in chapters 9, 10, and 11. And locked and sealed it over him to keep him from doing what? Deceiving the nations any more until the thousand years were ended. The problem is, is it doesn't feel like that, does it? There's enough verses in the Bible that tell us that uh, that, that Satan prowls around like a a lion seeking whom he may devour. There's a sense in which he still has a measure of influence. But he wants us to believe that he's got more influence than he has. That's what bullies do, isn't it? Bullies always want to appear bigger than they really are. But we're being told here by Jesus in the book of Revelation that a fundamental shift happened when Jesus Christ came the first time. He broke Satan's power and authority over the world. So Colossians 2 verse 15 tells us this about Jesus. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Jesus broke the power of Satan at the cross... Satan comes along and says, you, guilty. Is he right or wrong? He's right. But Jesus has paid the price to set us free. So Satan does tempt you to despair. And if you're a believer, sooner or later, you will feel the accusing lies of Satan. What do you say? What are you going to do about it? Look at Jesus, the good one. This is what I'm going to shout at you. There's a story told about Martin Luther, the great reformer, who talks an awful lot about... It, um, he gives testimony as to, as to how often he felt as if the devil was assailing him. And he says there was one day he couldn't sleep, he was all burned, and he walked down there and he saw a vision of something that is believed to be Satan or one of his minions standing in front of him, threatening him. And Philip Melanchthon, the guy who wrote up the story afterwards, said, Luther took one look, shrugged his shoulders, turned around and went back upstairs. Satan. Your accusations have been dealt with. Satan, your time is short. Your efforts are futile. You can kill me, but I belong to Jesus and there ain't nothing you can do about it. So when Satan tempts you to despair, you can shout that. There's a great picture, I think, that gets the theology just right in this book. Some of you would have read the book without pictures, Pilgrim's Progress. 
Remember, Pilgrim is travelling, he's Christian, he's travelling on the road to the celestial city. He's got in his hand the promises of God, and there in front of him are two huge lions blocking the way, standing on these pillars. They are fierce, they are roaring, they devour and rip people to shreds, and he doesn't want to go any nearer until he gets up close. I don't know whether you can see this from the pictures. Didn't get time to put it on the big screen. There are the lions seeking to devour him. But what do you notice about the lions? They're on. They're chained. They're tethered. They can only go so close. And he can walk by and walk through safely. So what does this mean? It doesn't mean that Satan can't harm you or tempt you. It doesn't mean that Satan is inactive. Or it doesn't mean that we shouldn't resist or that we shouldn't flee from Satan. But what it means is he can only touch you if you let him. So you go to the zoo and there's all the lions and the scary cats and they're, up in, the, they're in their enclosure with the 15 foot high fences. How often do you see those news reports, usually get out of America, of somebody who goes up and thinks, fence, lions, let's pat them. Puts their hand in through there into the cage and wonders why they don't get their arm back. But, oh, I didn't think they'd do it. It's a lion! That's what its job is. It does that kind of thing. But if you keep your hand out, you'll be okay. Some of you have put your hand in the cage, aren't you? Sometimes we do it by the films that we watch, by the way we give ourselves to different pursuits, by the way we spend our money, by the choices that we make, and by the company that we keep. We put in our hand in the lion's cage. Stop it. He cannot control your destiny unless you let him. He can't even control his own destiny. When Jesus says, bind him, gone. It's that easy. And notice how specific it is. The thing that Saint was stopping until Jesus came was the gospel going out to the nations. But now the gospel will be going out to the nations. He can't stop it. It was unthinkable back in the first century that the gospel would go to the nations. Here they were, the little Christians getting beat up and battered. They're killing us as fast as we're getting converted. That's how it felt. We're dying here, Lord. Surely we don't want to take it any further. I've got some statistics for you, for those who like numbers. In AD 100, so about 70 years after the death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus, less than 1% of the human population were believers. Uh, About 10% had been evangelized, but less than 1% were believers. 400 years later, in AD 500, obviously the world population had grown. About 30% of the whole population of the world had been evangelized, but by now, 20% were Christians. Then there was the Christendom period and the, uh, and, and, and the Romanizing of the church, and things stagnated and missions stopped. But then around about 1800, it all got going again. And then by 1900 AD... So 110, well, 113 years ago, the population of the world has grown, but 35% of them Christian. 46% of them had been evangelized and been told the gospel. What about in the year 2000? Population of the world has increased to, what, by then, over 6 billion, now 7 billion. 73% of the world population or people groups of the world, of which there's something like 12,000 people groups, 73% of those people groups have been reached with the gospel. And in the year 2000, it was estimated that 35% of the world's population are Christians. So in the last 50 years, through explosions of the gospel in the likes of China, in Brazil, in India, and in Africa, it is not inconceivable now that in 50 years from now, more than 50% of the world population will name Jesus Christ as King. Satan, you're rubbish. You're not cutting it, lad, because you've been bound. 
So more than anything, this text is a text of the Bible to drive us out to tell more people about Jesus, because Satan can't do nothing about it. It's a text of the Bible that says, go to the hard places, go to the new people group, find the new places and the new generations that know little or nothing about Jesus, and it speaks a great place to start, and get telling them, because Jesus has bound the influence of Satan for a period while the gospel can go out, through the gospel age, the church age, the millennium, in this period, we're supposed to get busy telling people about Jesus. And that's something worth giving your life to, because Satan is bound. Right, that was my longest of my points. The rest are a lot quicker. Let's move forward. First one, your enemy is bound. Second of all, I love this one, your soul is secure. Verse 4, I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus, uh, testimony for Jesus, and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or their hands. We've heard about that in other parts of Revelation. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who have part in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. You have a soul. You are not a pigeon. You are not a horse. You have a soul. And there were so many casualties of war that in the first century the believers were saying, what of the souls of those who have been beheaded for Christ? What about us who've spiritually come alive, but we're getting beaten up down here? Are we safe? Are we secure? It's conservatively estimated that 200,000 people a year currently are being killed because they love Jesus. In Cambodia in the late 70s, when Pol Pot and his communist regime did their social experiment, they wiped out 9 out of 10 of all the believers in that country in a five-year period. 9 out of 10 Christians killed. It was, it was found that the, at the end of that period, there were only two pastors left in the whole of the country. So I don't know whether it's, it wasn't 9 out of 10 pastors. <laughs> Be a pastor, die. That was just the way it was going to roll. And in those circumstances, the question gets asked, does God care, is he playing with his saints as if they are merely pawns to be used up? And in these four, three verses, we get here a vision in heaven again. You can tell by the thrones, the 40 odd times that thrones are mentioned, it's always a vision of a heaven reality that speaks of earthly realities too. We see this picture here. Uh, and I saw the souls of those who'd been beheaded because of the testimony for Jesus and because of the word of God. I think what we've got here is a picture of all people, both martyred, died, oh, martyred, died and still living for Jesus, who have been raised to spiritual life in Jesus. Many of them have been martyred. One's beheaded and martyred. They maintain their testimony and not packed in. Uh, one of the problems with this translation is that it, it's when it, it, it moves between um, the first part of verse 4 and the second part, it sort of says, uh, beheaded and did not worship. It's actually, and those who did not worship. So it's both those who died in the Lord and those who haven't, but are standing for, faithful to Jesus and not bound down um, to world systems. Do you see? So here are those who, the ones who are beheaded and have been martyred but maintain their testimony. There are those who love the word of God. There are those who are not sold out to the things of this world and lived as if this world is all there is. There are those, they are those who have sided with Jesus. And what are they marked by? Answer, brought to life. They were dead, but they are brought to life. They are resurrected. They are made alive by God. We need to turn to one place so you can see what's happening. Flip back to Ephesians chapter, uh, chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And this is the Apostle Paul's description of everybody and then those who get called and raised to new life. So let me shout out a page number for us, please. Eight two five. Eight two five. Page 
This is the Apostle Paul's description of everybody spiritually. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live. We got that with the big number two? Okay. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. So when you're under Satan's influence, you are dead. And when you're dead, you don't bring yourself to life again. You will ask any doctor, go into a morgue in a hospital, and you see all the cadavers that are lying out there, the dead bodies lying out there, you can stand there and yell at them, live! They ain't going to live, and they ain't going to move. The only thing that will change them is if they are brought to life, resurrected. Verse 3, all of us who lived among them at one time, gratifying, at, sorry, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. So that is every soul by nature is in that situation, cut off from God and an object of wrath, and there's nothing we can do about it. You can't one day decide, you know what? I'm going to follow God. You can't. Dead bodies don't just decide, I'm going to jump up and walk away, thanks very much. I think we do not spontaneously regenerate. Verse 4. But, because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, did what? Made us alive. Made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions, and it is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realm to Christ Jesus. So right now, if you have been saved by Jesus Christ, in some spiritual sense you are resurrected, raised up, and you have got a, he- a standing in the heavenly places. That's quite amazing. Because we're in Christ, we get attributed his status in the heavenlies. We are resurrected and reigning. Now I realise that's quite a frightening prospect for some of us because we can't even order our own diary. We can't even get ourselves out of bed half the time. But we're reigning with Christ. The angels look at us and go, Cool, look at them, I wish I was there. That is our status now. We are raised. And that has a couple of implications that I need to bring out. So back to Revelation chapter 20. What does this tell us? Well, the first implication is this. That if somebody dies physically in the Lord, our whole view of what is happening to them must be transformed. Physical death is the separation of body and soul. Okay? You put the body in the ground or on the fire and in the sea, but the soul is with Jesus if you belong to Jesus. And that's only for those who belong to Jesus. Now the problem with death is that it can look so horrible, and it is, it is not a friend, it is horrible. So you see somebody after a car crash, dead, ugly, horrible, you see somebody sapped of life through the cruelty and ugliness that is cancer, and you see it looks as if their life is slipping away from them. But if they belong to Jesus, they're just a moment away from real life. Death means life for those who belong to Jesus. Imagine that. Imagine that if you're elderly here today. You're feeling like, oh, my life is gone. No, you're closer to real life. So you're going along, uh, you've got your friends around your bed, uh, around your bed because you're on your deathbed. You're struggling to pull breath into your body. You're hurt all over. You're like, give me more morphine. Ah, this is horrible. People are sitting around there crying. And suddenly... I don't hurt anymore! My wrinkles have gone! I thought I was alive before, but this is alive! Wow! Of course, the people still sitting around the bed, mourning and rightly so, they're lost. Because death isn't a friend, it's a cruelty. But it's a doorway to real life. This is wonderful. What we are spiritually and have been raised up in our souls now, we will be physically as well. 
There's nothing more beautiful, is there, when you speak to a senior member of a church family who has walked many miles with Jesus, and although their body is wasting away, they have a, a serenity and a confidence and a joy and a hope that this world knows nothing of. For their soul has been regenerated and enjoying that, and then they go to catch up with their body. Well, their body goes and catches up with them. It's beautiful. So let me challenge you on this. Some of us live as if life after death doesn't matter or it's a second-rate alternative. Please don't cling to life here. Life here is nothing compared to life there. There's that film, The Bucket List. We showed it at Welcome Club, but it's tragic. The Bucket List is about two old fellows who've got more money than sense and have a list of 50 things they want to do before they die. And as they work through them, it's hilarious, but it's tragic because that's all they have got left. Can I tell you that the best of experiences now, even if you hit your top 50 things of things to do before I die, they'll leave you empty and unsatisfied. One second in glory will be more recompense for whatever you've had to face here than you can possibly imagine. Can I ask you to make every decision in the light of the fact that you are going to have a life after death? Let that invade your today. In fact, a great decision for each one of us here today would be, if each one of us say, because I know I've got eternal life today, I make the decision to do this, or to not do that. Each one of you can make just one little decision today for that end, can't you? There's another implication of these, these three verses. Um, and it's that you know about what will happen then. Look in verse 6. Blessed and holy are those who have part in the first resurrection. That's one of the multiple blessings that come up. I think there's seven of them in the book of Revelation. Blessed are those who have part in the first resurrection, who are raised with Christ now, who have had their sins forgiven, who are united to Jesus, whose soul is alive to God. Blessed are those who have part in this first resurrection. The second death, has no power over them, but they will be priests. The second death, first death is physical death, second death is judgment day. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a, for a thousand years. Okay? If in the first resurrection you got life, you are guaranteed your future. We already have the verdict on Christians. So the verdict of the last day, Judgment Day, isn't up for debate or to guess. The day is set for judgment, but you can know for sure now what the verdict is, and if you're in Team Jesus, it's not guilty. That's not to say we're not sinners, we are sinners, and we should be judged, but Christ has been judged so that we, and we've been raised with him. So we're not Muslims. And as best I understand, Muslim friends, they are waiting to see whether their good ways outweigh their bad ways. Or Buddhist friends, uh, they're trapped in this cruel and wicked cycle called karma, where they try desperately in one life to work off, through pain, difficulty and struggle, enough of their bad deeds from the previous life that the next one they get promoted to a better life. You know, there are mothers in certain parts of India who will break their kids' elbows and deform their kids' arms in order to make their life more difficult for them so that their next life will be better. Don't ever doubt the power of Satan's lies to wreck lives. Now we have a judgment day and the verdict has been set by Jesus. He said, alive you will sail through Judgment Day on my ticket. And of course, sometimes we find that difficult because all of us have got things in our past that we've not told other people that nag away at our conscience and we think, surely that, can that be dealt with? I can't forgive myself. And Jesus says, well, I knew a long way in advance. I knew what I was getting in for. I can make you alive. So there's that wonderful verse in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your heart on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. You are not saved by your feelings. 
you are saved by Christ's death and resurrection power. Right, time is running out short, and I want to go to all of this, but I've, oh dear me, right, hold on. How am I going to do the rest of this chapter in five minutes? The answer is I'm not really, am I? Gosh, tell me what to do. Stop. Uh, okay, let, let, I'll do the next bit really quickly and then you can decide whether to carry on. Uh, can't do it next week. John's already preparing one. Got to keep on track. Right, let me do this. I'll do this next one quickly then we'll decide. Can't you decide whether to go on anymore? Okay, bearing in mind the last point's the best one, but anyway. Uh, right, verses 7 through to 10. This sound, all sounds a bit mad, doesn't it? But it's not. When the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. In numbers, they are like the sand on the seashore. They marched across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, the city he loves. But fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now look, this isn't the first time we've seen this. Multiple times in the book of Revelation we've seen this end great battle. We've seen the beast brought in. We've seen the prostitute brought in. We've seen the enemies of God. Same battle, rerun, but this time the... Look, what happens to Satan? Well, this is what he's trying to do. It tells us in the Bible that Jesus Christ comes dies on the cross, rose from the grave, ascends to heaven, then there is this church age where Satan is bound and where the gospel is going out and when more and more people are coming to trust Jesus, turn from their sin, everybody's getting an opportunity to respond and then just before Jesus comes back and, and blows the final whistle, it's as if, uh, and it's spoken of, we had it read in 2 Thessalonians 2, it's as if there's a particular time of lawlessness and demonic influence that has well, it's been held back for a period, but just gets let, let loose uncontrollably just before Jesus comes back and goes bang. So you can have a look at that too in, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It's what we see here in verse 7. When the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison. And it's interesting that when you track down church history, there's almost always an intense period of persecution in one place in the world or another. And when that's going on, the believers in that area are going... This must be it. It's that bad. And it is bad. And then it comes to an end, and they go, phew, that wasn't the end. So quite often, always in the world, there is somebody who thinks, the man of lawlessness has been let loose, Satan is doing his thing, and Jesus is coming back next week. The answer is, 2,000 years on, we don't know. All we know is, Satan keeps trying his thing, God keeps knocking them back into place, church grows and then in another place persecutions rise up but there will be an ultimate one and when that happens there's this Gog and Magog thing which is just a picture out of Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39 of a massive mass of people who hate God gathering together almost like a global force against God and hate wanting to shush him up and quiet him down that's what that Gog and Magog stand for go and read it when it's raining later in Ezekiel 37, 38 and 39 and so here we see a global force. Notice they echo the people of God. In number, they are like the sand of the seashore. Where we heard that, I'll give you a hint, Abraham. And what Alan was talking about earlier? The promise of God that his people would be as many as the sand of the seashore. So if you like, it's an antitype or an opposite of God's people who together are trying to shush God out. And back in the first century, that thought, that's impossible. But we've, we've got globalisation now, haven't we? If Coca-Cola can take over the world, and MTV have got a, uh, a music station in virtually, um, uh, a music channel in virtually every country on the world, and it can be downloaded through, downloaded through that interweb thing, you've got a whole world order trying to shush God out, shut him up. So it's, it's, it's totally understandable that hostile people who want to quieten God down but then I love this at the end of verse 9. All that's going on, the same like, yeah baby! But fire came down from heaven and devoured them. For those of you who've seen the film Indiana Jones, you remember that scene, it's great. Indiana Jones, the hero, has just been chasing and beating up all the bad guys. He's in a big crowd of people. He's knackered, worn out, hat dishevelled. Oh, and there in front of him, the crowd parts, and there's this sort of samurai dude with a big sword, and he's doing all these tricks like this. And, 
and Indiana Jones looks absolutely, oh no, I don't, uh, 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 uh. and then the, the guy's eyes are blaming, stepping forward, I'm going to lock your head off, cut your arms off, and have you for the day, and, I'm, and Indiana Jones just goes, guy falls the floor, walks off. That's what's going to happen, Global Edition. No battle here. The battle was won at Calvary. The battle was won at the cross. Holy fire here comes down. Can I tell you, holy fire, or fire comes down, it's always about God's goodness. It's a goodness that consumes evil. All that is exposed to God that has ex- opposed him will be snuffed out in a second. Hell is not a torture chamber. Hell is a place of justice in the presence of the living mighty king who returns, and evil will not do well there. Evil, well for evil, it will be torment for anyone who hates God. And that's what we see here, pictured by this fire stuff. So, a day will be done. Give me four minutes and I'll finish up, we'll do the whole lot, here we go. Last point, let's read verse, somebody read for us please, save my voice, somebody read verses 11 through to 15. So here it is, this is the great day, this is the day of reckoning, thank you for reading that. There will be no excuses, you can't pull a sickie, you can't get a doctor's note, there is no hiding place. Every place in the world will be accounted for, the sea, Hades, even death. Every soul that has ever lived, every, every gift of life that God has ever issued will be called back and called to account for the way that it has lived. lived. Everybody will be resurrected and have to give an answer. It is appointed once to die, and then the judgment, says the book of Hebrews. Now, our generation is possibly the most judgmental on record... Well, it's probably, yeah, nothing new under the sun, is it? Put it this way. Our generation grinds its teeth uh, evidences of injustice in courtrooms or on soap operas, and criticises everybody for just about everything. And the favourite phrase of the day is, that's disgusting, that! and yet thinks that that same scrutiny will not be brought to us by the true and living God. We are all to be subject to the judgment that we have visited upon other people, which is, what have you done? I wonder Weston whether you could just check that at the back. I suppose if you like, do you remember the, the old uh, TV programme, that This Is Your Life? Was it Michael Parkinson who used to do it? And they'd pull up a celebrity and he'd pull out a big book and read from it, this is your life, and people would rock up and say, you did this and you did that, and they always sort of like got rid of the nasty bits and put all the good bits in. According to the Bible, that's a biblical idea. Here we find that books are opened on everybody. This is sort of like the cosmic edition of this is your life. Somebody has a biography of you and me. It's a real page turner. Look verse 12, we see. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. Do you think people would be interested in what you've been up to? Verse 13. And each person was judged according to what he had done. God cares about your life and your choices. He has given you a life with which you are to honour him and to serve and love others and in so doing reflect him and his generosity and goodness. And if you think you have lived the perfect life, on that day you've got nothing to worry about. So let me ask you what's in your book. You've got nothing to worry about if you're selfless, pure, true in love, totally devoted to God, never try to use or manipulate anybody else. If you're like that, there'll be nothing bad that you've done in there and you're in the clear. 
if you're totally fair this thing, it's not like you're judged against anything other than what you've done. You just get judged on what you have done. But here's my problem. I'm stuffed. I spend my life editing myself. I do image management. In the wise eyes of Steve Casey, I edit and airbrush the things that I do. I spend my time editing out my cruel words or excusing them. I justify my self-indulgences. I glory in my worship of other things other than the true and living God. I spend my time excusing away or passing the book and blame shifting. I view myself as a victim who's allowed to get away with that because of this. But on that day, I can't pull the wool over his eyes. He judges what I have done and he sees the motives of my heart. And verse 15 is quite scary, isn't it? Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. And what's all that about? Ted Donnelly wrote a book called Heaven and Hell. He's an Irish guy, pastor of a, a principal of a Bible college over there. And this is, this is how he sums it up. This is hell. Everything good in you will be taken away because it belongs to God anyway. And everything bad in you will be let loose to its full potential. Isn't that scary? All your evil passions will consume you rampantly until you become utterly foul. Such will be your existence. Think of the most derelict in the gutter person. His existence is paradise compared to the poverty of hell. And you will be there because you didn't want God. I can't think of anything more urgent than to make sure I've got an answer to that. Can you? Verse 15, or sorry, verse 12, another book was opened, which is the book of life. So there are all these books that record what we've done and how we've lived, but there is another book called the book, not of death, of life. There is a clause, there is a way, there is, a, there is something else. I need to have my name in that book. But the question is, how do I do it? Because my deeds aren't going to get me there, are they? We know that much already. We've already established that C.K. Casey's deeds have condemned him to hell. I could never go to church enough. I could never be sincere enough. I could never pay my taxes enough. I could never um, feed my kids enough um, genetic, ungenetically modified food so that I'm a good parent who feeds their kids right. I could never recycle enough. I could never preach enough sermons. I can't do that. It won't work for me. Write me in, Lord, is all I can say. Please, Lord, write me in. He has to write me in. I can't write myself in. And the problem is, with the Lord Jesus, I can't suck up, I can't bribe my way in. He doesn't have favourites. He is totally faithful, but abounding in love. My only hope of having my name written in is his graciousness. If he was to not write my name in, he would be perfectly just. But if he does write my name in, it is going to be purely on the basis of his generosity. I am, if you like, dangling at his mercy. So if I'm hanging by some thread that isn't even there, I'm just am I free falling through space? utterly headed in one direction, I need somebody who can scoop me up in his powerful hands and deliver me away from what I'm heading for on my own. Can there be anything more important than that? Lord Jesus, write me in because I'm taking my stand on the cross. My only hope is your grace. So can I ask you as I finish, have you asked the Lord to write you in? Can there be anything more important than that than knowing your name is in the book of life? 
You'll know your name is in the book of life because you have trusted in the promise of Jesus to save all those who come. Jesus says if you come humbly, repenting of your sin and trusting in him as Lord, he will in no way turn you away. You can know you're in because you've said yes to his grace. Can I tell you, it would be easier to face him today and any day in this life than it will be anyone's name was not found written in the book of life he was thrown into the lake of fire we're going to sing a song now I wonder Joe whether you can click onto it and it takes us back to the scene it's a song we know really really well but we don't want to let what we sing it fly past us before the throne of God above I am utterly stuffed if I'm trusting in my own good deeds because they've exposed me. But before the throne of God above, I can have a strong, a perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. Click the next one. What's it say there? For everybody who's called on the name of Jesus, he's written us into the book of life. Let's stand and sing together. Click back to the first few of you.